Let's resume our conference. Welcome to our second section. This will be a legal se section. Uh, they will be discussing the um, uh, various um, IT le legislation issues. Marina Rashko will be moderating the discussion. Yes, uh, good afternoon, colleagues. It's a pleasure to welcome all of you here. It's the first day of TLTCon, and everyone is still uh, refreshed and happy to see each other. Today, we will touch upon several issues um, that are interesting and uh, useful uh, for the lawyers. This will be uh, a rather intensive discussion and our uh, legal experts will touch upon uh, various international issues. We'll start with the presentation uh, by Chris Bakrich, an independent consultant. He'll um, brief us on recent developments in the EU legislation and regulation. Chris, uh, over to you. Uh, we don't have Chris? <laughs> okay. Uh, what about Pavel? Do we have Pavel with us? Shall we give the floor to Pavel then? Okay, then our speaker will be Pavel Patrikeev. You all know Pavel. No, really, you know him. You've met him. He is a frequent speaker and uh, he started his own law firm, uh, Patrikeev and Partners. I know um, Pavel personally, and I'm glad that he could join us today. Hello, Pavel. Good to see you. Uh, the floor is yours. Uh, you have about 15 minutes, well, definitely not longer than 20 minutes. There will be several presentations during this section. I we'll, would like to have some time for questions and answers. I'd like to uh, welcome everyone. First of all, unfortunately, I couldn't be present uh, there uh, myself uh, uh, personally. Uh, but in any case, um, good to see all of you uh, too. I was a legal department head of uh, the legal department at Regru at the end of last year. I left the company and I started my own uh, legal service for the Cave and Partners with support startups, IT services, uh, hosters, registrars, providers. So um, my uh, area of expertise uh, did not change. It's still IT and domains. Today I'll talk about the issues of uh, legal regulation of domain deals. I wanted to uh, to prepare an overview. I really wanted to brief myself on this topic and uh, whether there were any changes in the legislation. We'll talk about the domain names as objects of the civil law. I'll try to fit into the allocated um, time slot. Well, I will um, leave less uh, time for theory and uh, allocate more time uh, to, to discuss the practical issues. In any case, if you would like to learn more about theory, there are many publications, there is literature on the topic that I can refer you to. I work with startups and they sell domains and websites to each other, they work with exchanges, and I acquired certain new legal insights through my private practice. But let's start with theory, as promised. We first need to understand what the domain name is as an object of civil regulation. There were no changes uh, here. Uh, the, uh, not not uh, digital rights um, uh, amendments to the legislation, nor the regulation of uh, digital assets uh, did not affect 
check the uh, domain names uh, definition and the legislator um, is not uh, uh, is not uh, thinking much about uh, the regulation of domain names, at least not to the extent uh, that the regulation was developing, say, five years ago. Uh, I'll have a couple of slides about the consent that we have, a consensus rather, uh, that uh, um, was built in practice. We know that the domain name uh, can be transferred, it can be uh, rented. Uh, here is a, a link to uh, Marina Rashpo's uh, presentation, uh, publication. Um, on the uh, on domain names and their place in civil law, uh, domain is uh, the result of intellectual um, activity. Uh, it's not uh, an object to exclusive rights, though it's not subject to exclusive rights. Uh, and I can refer you both to the Civil Code and to one of the rather old uh, resolutions of the Supreme Court of Russia from 2019. The courts generally uh, agree uh, on this uh, matter. Even if uh, a court uh, decides that uh, a domain is uh, similar to the trademark and has uh, a, and the same uh, scope of uh, civil regulation um, applies to it, well, in, in any case, a domain is still not uh, subject to exclusive rights. Uh, it doesn't prevail over the trademark. It's still uh, 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 at time of designation. My favorite definition of a domain is something that can be transferred in a deal, in a transaction. Um, it comes from the European courts. Over here you can see the quote. Uh, I like the term that the court applied and its approach to the domain name as a quasi an um, object uh, property rights, a kind of a property right that uh, provides temporary use of the internet space uh, as designated by the numbers or uh, letters. So uh, you enter into a contract with a registrar and you acquire a set of unique uh, rights, rights of administration, and the idea is that uh, you can decide on the name, uh, you can link the domain uh, to certain servers and place content uh, using this domain name and things like that. Uh, you can say that, well, it's not um, a very recent case, but at least it's something that I found. The Supreme Court also uh, considers the uh, domain name and the right of its administration as a property right rather than a, as a, the result of intellectual activity. Um, the parties in the deal, if they want to dispose of the website, uh, they need to consider three elements. First, either uh, the domain name should be transferred from one account to another, or access to the account should be provided uh, for the other company to, or a person to uh, control this domain name. There should also be a change introduced to the register. The data, um, the owner's data should be updated and the domain uh, designation can also be used in the business practice, just like you are using a trademark or uh, uh, some letters or numbers. If you look um, at the contracts, we see that the market um, harmonized. Um, there are big registrars. I analyze their offers and I see that they basically quote each other. Uh, it's, it would be the same wording. Uh, the registrars can see the, or the administrators can see the domain name as a, a continuous service, a service of entering uh, the owner's name into the register. I participated in different court uh, disputes and uh, it was the same position that I held, and the um, courts agreed with this uh, uh, position. Uh, 
especially if there is a dispute over uh, money, you need to decide when was the service uh, provided. Uh, was it terminated uh, when uh, the entry was made into the register? Uh, does that mean that uh, the full service was um, provided and completed at that time, or is it a continuous service? Well, the courts believe that it's a continued or a continuous uh, service. Uh, and just making a record in the register uh, does not uh, bring the service to an end. Uh, so that basically that's the position of the market and also the position of the courts on the matter. We know that uh, there are certain um, challenges uh, during uh, the sale and purchase of domains. Uh, but the, here is an article that I found uh, back from 2014, and uh, the re researcher um, doesn't um, hold um, a positive view of various session agreements. But in any case, there is this averaged approach when the website is considered to be a set of costs and it includes not only the domain, but it may uh, be associated with some additional costs. And some of these costs can be recorded as an intangible asset, others cannot. And so the uh, original cost, the pricing, uh, that would include the costs associated with the design of the website, the registration cost, etc., etc. In in any case, um, the Ministry of Finance in 2020 and then more recent communications, um, uh, just like the Supreme Court, uh, states that the uh, income uh, from the sale of domain names should be treated in the same fashion as income from the sale of other property, property rights. Uh, what next? Well, actually, uh, there is certain confusion um, in the domain market with respect to certain matters. Uh, what I mean to say is, uh, it's wonderful that the law is uh, used more or less the streamlined terminology, but sometimes in the contracts you read about tangible and tangible answers, domain and websites, and they are defined differently in various documents. You can find all kinds of descriptions here. I'm quoting a document of one of the exchanges, an offer of this exchange uh, that offers exchanging domain names, and they decided to uh, define um, tangible assets, and they included everything, uh, scripts, domain names, telegram channels, and this matters, that's important, because if under a contract one a party transfers a domain name to a different party, the, it's not a domain name that is transferred, but also uh, several adjacent rights are also transferred, like the design of the website or access to uh, the website. Uh, and, uh, uh, mixing all of this in, in you know, one bundle, uh, it creates unnecessary confusion when uh, the actual uh, deal is concluded. Uh, once again, the participants of the market uh, do not agree on what a tangible or an intangible asset is. An exchange we probably can be forgiven because they are interested in just having the parties enter into a deal and they 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 are interested in making money on the deal. Uh, the fact that the uh, domain is transferred um, using their own uh, automation means and the personal accounts on their site, um, but whether the parties actually formalize the deal and what kind of definitions they use, uh, it matters less to an exchange, uh, to, to a platform. They usually um, you know, a veto or kickstart they have uh, uh, special provisions in the contract uh, that uh, certain aspects are not within the scope of uh, that uh, that particular uh, contract and not uh, within the jurisdiction of the site providing the service. Uh, usually there is an agreement or a contract between the parties. Uh, the contract is uh, governed by uh, the civil uh, civil code, uh, the rules of uh, part one of the civil code, uh, like a mixed contract, for instance, the deals, just like they used to be in the practice in the past, and now uh, the deals with domains contain elements of several types of contracts uh, with 
the lawyer discussions whether uh, you can enter into a license agreement for a domain name. Well, no, uh, you can't. Uh, so basically, um, now uh, the market agrees that it should be the contract of uh, transfer of rights. I, again, I'm not going into the theoretical details, but again, every contract like this will contain elements of various other forms of contracts. It's obvious also that the contract can refer to terms and structures uh, or words that are not included into the laws or not defined in the laws sometimes. Uh, well, of course, we can expect them to appear in the legislation sometime in the future, but still uh, very often the um, contracts uh, to transfer domain names would contain references to ICANN rules, to register uh, registry rules, um, and things like that. Such deals, um, uh, two-party deals, um, and disposal of domain name deals, uh, say, at uh, uh, the uh, discretion of the administrator, uh, well, uh, the invalidity criteria um, for, uh, also apply to such deals. Here is one case in which I participated uh, sometime in the past. Uh, the regulator abused its powers and uh, it transferred the rights um, to a domain name from one party to another, and then after a while, it took a long while. Um, the uh, deal was uh, was recognized null and void, and the administrator had to roll it back and restore the initial uh, owner and um, its rights. I have not seen many uh, cases like that, but again, the null and void rules apply to those deals, just like they do in other uh, civil law cases. Uh, leading into confusion. I mean, all these criteria are well known uh, to the lawyers. Uh, what else can we say about the legal practice? Um, well, uh, what is there? A domain is not a thing. It's not a goods. It's not. Um, it's neither. It is a result of intellectual property. Again, uh, the practice agrees that. Uh, for instance, in a rent agreement, if it's really a rental agreement, uh, you will not be able to rent a domain name. In practice, neither as a lawyer nor as an employee of a, a registrar uh, did I encounter any rental agreements for domain names, but uh, when I was preparing for this presentation, I found templates of a, a contract uh, lease or rental of domain names. I don't know whether anyone has ever used it, but the internet offers those templates. You can find them, you can Google them. And uh, uh, transfer of domain name from one party to another, it looks like session, uh, ceding the rights to administration, one party. Um, in uh, the relations with a uh, uh, registrar, uh, asks uh, uh, to replace that registrant with another registrant, and yes, uh, this uh, replacement uh, is a technical. Is, it it, it um, proceeds in a technical fashion through technical means, uh, and uh, it happens via a, a personal account, and the data in the register will be uh, updated. Uh, the data of the previous registrant will be replaced with the data of the new registrant. Now, speaking about the contracts and the current practice, in uh, one of the databases you can find a template uh, for uh, the contract uh, to transfer the rights to domain name. It gives you an insight about uh, into these deals. <clears throat> it's uh, an obligation to transfer the right of use at it's uh, a fee. It's not a domain name, but the right of use, uh, if you will notice. And then you list the char characteristics of such a domain, uh, including the letter or number or symbolic uh, designation of the domain name, but also the DNS, for instance. It, uh, some guarantees are provided that the uh, registrant is really a registrant. Uh, in many cases, the registrant also, uh, registrants uh, provide uh, certificates. Uh, Maybe it's still relevant for mass media, online mass media, uh, that when they uh, are registered uh, as a mass media, they need to confirm that the domain and name really belongs to them. Sometimes I also include um, some uh, reference to who is, for instance. Um, and uh, 
also these deals uh, often prescribe certain actions on the side of the acquirer of the rights and the transfer of the rights it's like when you're transferring a trademark transferring a trademark there is an intermediary uh, who needs to take certain actions there is a procedure you uh, submit an application you uh, make a, uh, you make um, amendments to the DNS uh, records, uh, maybe, uh, and then you need to collect the confirmation that the domain name is re-registered to a new registrant. Uh, usually, all these actions, all these steps, all these procedures are prescribed in the contract. I saw it in the contract. The uh, accountants uh, require uh, like um, an act of acceptance, an uh, act of transfer. I don't know. It's um, it, it looks antiquated. Anti Great uh, practice, but uh, sometimes yes, you, you will read it in the uh, uh, in the in the contract that the parties also need to sign some letter of acceptance or act of acceptance confirming the transfer of domain names. Often these contracts, like I was saying, are mixed contracts. They have elements from different other types of contracts, and often people would like to get not just the rights to administer a domain name, but they would like to get a whole suite of uh, intellectual property objects. Uh, access to the accounts so often the websites are transferred i when they the business is sold and then uh, we say that uh, basically um, transferring a domain name can be part of a purchase and sale of shares in a business in a company and uh, this would be uh, recorded in an amendment or an addendum to an uh, a purchase and sale agreement. And of course, the uh, buyers and the sellers would like to list all the intellectual property and not just intellectual property, their rights and objects that they are acquiring or transferring. Over here, you can see an example from uh, uh, one such contract uh, that we supported. You can see that uh, a domain name is just one of many. And again, there is an issue of determining its uh, legal status. The, um, the legal status of accounts on social media, for instance, is quite a special uh, story, and often the contracts will contain lots of curious elements. The parties agree how the transfer will be transferred via an archive or the same thing, login and password. Um, uh, pairs uh, by email and how to confirm the effect uh, of transfer and domain is often is one uh, item in those uh, blended uh, contracts where e e a trademark can also be transferred uh, or uh, some other property. And uh, uh, in conclusion, I also wanted to bring in the subject of auctions. I couldn't find a lot of court practice um, around uh, disputes uh, related to domain shops or domain uh, exchanges and the transfer of domains that happen via these platforms. Uh, but I studied the templates of the contracts and agreements between the registrars and uh, exchanges. Um, and I can only repeat what I've already said. Uh, the registrars are not interested in formalizing relations between buyers and sellers because it's not their responsibility, it's not their headache. Usually they will just list the rules of functioning of those exchanges in terms of transferring the loss. They define what's a purchase and what a sale is in order to understand at what time the fee can be collected and at what time the deal should be considered closed. And these contracts are similar to SaaS, uh, really providing uh, the right of use to a service or it's a fee-based uh, contract for services. So the registrars use uh, something closer to SaaS, uh, like a cloud provision of services, um, similar to a marketplace. And there is also the shadow market still, and uh, of course the uh, courts don't uh, take those cases, but the shadow market uh, exists, and I wanted to investigate that as well. And I see that... Uh, people, uh, I mean, it's something that uh, um, that um, uh, was quite uh, a spread uh, uh, or popular in the 1990s uh, when people uh, placed an ad in a newspaper, uh, you know, uh, stating the price at which they would be uh, willing to sell a domain name. It's it's still done these days. Um, uh, we know very little about which documents are actually signed by the parties, but uh, often you 
Would you find these cases when uh, two parties come together to uh, a registrar and say that, okay, one party sees and the other party accepts the right to domain name, and could you please, the registrar, make changes to the database? Uh, of um, uh, of the registrants, uh, the market. This market still functions. Um, it functions outside of the proper legal field, and we have not seen any dramatic shift uh, in the regulation of that activity in the last, say, five years. The registrars optimize their offers. The exchanges. Uh, have become a bit more competent in handling consumer rights, and the market is used to uh, view in a domain name uh, as a valuable asset, an asset that can be traded, and in business activity, I mean, uh, domain names have become um, a, a routine asset. Now, conclusions. Um, I don't want to repeat uh, because it's it's everything that, uh, to repeat myself, it's everything that I've already uh, said. I don't know if uh, uh, you actually enjoyed this presentation. Again, uh, there isn't uh, there isn't really much uh, that, that, um, that, that um, we can say on this topic. The, the uh, court practice uh, has established itself. Uh, the legal profession is more or less in agreement on what a domain name is and how it should be treated from the. Uh, civil law point of view, there aren't many changes in the market. Um, the uh, topic is still covered by the scholars. Uh, in practical terms, again, uh, the market emerged in 1990s and 2000s. Uh, the market has become a bit more formal thanks to the registrars. Uh, we see emerging um, uh, shops or marketplaces uh, for domain names, uh, but again, there isn't much uh, dynamics uh, in this uh, field of research. Uh, I guess I will stop here. And thank you for listening. I'm done. Thank you, Pavel. You can uh, forever uh, watch the water flowing and the fire burning, and you can forever discuss what a domain name is. And although you say that the court practice has established itself, but uh, still there are many PhD works written on the topic. I mean, the scholars are still curious about uh, researching domain names. Um, no, really, I see that there's still a lot of interest to this topic. Pavel, can you um, uh, please stay with us uh, now? We would like to talk to Vladislav Javnierczyk uh, from Austria BY because uh, uh, he will be presenting the Belarus point of view, or rather the Belarus legislation point of view on the subject matter. Uh, Andrei Vorobyov yesterday asked me, um, so what's the problem with domain names regulation? Uh, do do we need more uh, bylaws and uh, legislation? Is, why are we so concerned for domain names? Uh, they aren't getting enough legal protection because there is not enough regulation. Should, should we enrich our legislation uh, with uh, the relevant provisions? Should the government interfere or should the domains still be subject to self-regulation? Should should they be governed by soft law rather than hard law? What, what do you think? What is your opinion? I will start from afar, uh, but um, then I will eventually ask your question. The Stoics, you know, the Greek philosophers, they um, they uh, um, they uh, followed. They try to follow the density to be followers, uh, but uh, those they said that they, they claimed that those who ignored uh, the fate or the destiny, uh, destiny would still catch up with that person. Uh, so, same here. The domain market is a good example of this dictum. The law is always lagging behind. Uh, sometimes uh, it happens for objective, sometimes for subjective reasons. I mean, for political, social, and other non-law-related uh, reasons. So today, I think the matter is well. It's not like this. This question is. It's not like it's no longer relevant, but we see that the court practice, the registrars, the lawyers, they um, they 
made themselves comfortable already in uh, this um, situation where uh, there is not enough uh, legislation. Uh, so it's not it's no longer a matter of whether we need more legislation or less legislation. It's just that there is practice already, and there are deals, and there are parties to the deals in the market. And they um, manage to come to to an agreement. I support uh, contracts like this. I support deals, and I see as practicing law that there is an idea in the head of the market, if you will, about what the domain is and how it should be transferred. Uh, whether there is legislation or there is no legislation the rules still exist because the rules can be both written and uh, not written and when a certain area is under regulated i mean okay there will be some well soft law call it whatever you like so i think that at this stage the um legislators are more interested in infrastructure and security uh cyber security but um the civil law uh, regulation and uh, identify in domain name as an object of civil law, uh, uh, well, even if uh, the domain name would be considered um, uh, a result of intellectual uh, activity, uh, even if uh, this happens, I don't think many things will change immediately. In the market. I mean, the market regulated itself. The market knows how to handle domain names. So, um, again, the legislators are behind. Uh, Self-regulation is not a matter of priority or choice, really. It's just something that has happened. It happens everywhere, in any field. Uh, I don't know, deep fakes, neural networks, um, or using the uh, product uh, of a uh, AI activity. Like, there is no legislation uh, around that. Um, the, the, there are discussions like in the European Union everywhere, but the market already exists, and uh, this is the magic. The contracts are being concluded. So, from the legal point of view, it's not a matter of principle. Whether there is hard law, no hard law, legislation, no legislation, the market will find a way to sell domain names and to use the products of artificial intelligence and to use deepfakes in business. I mean, that, that's that's my answer. I hope um, I made myself clear. Well, yes, thank you very much uh, for your answer. Because often you hear the lawyers are reproached uh, uh, because they always tend to say no at first, and then having thought about it, uh, Maybe the lawyers will say yes eventually, but it's the same same here. I think uh, uh, what I'm hearing from you is that self-regulation works and it's uh, much more flexible. Um, you referred to an article that we published together with Sergey Kapolov, who is presently here. This is our position too. The legislation and regulation is possible, of course, uh, but uh, whether it's necessary, it's a big question mark because there is already self-regulation of many domain names related matters. So, Pavel, please stay with us. We'll come back to domain names again. And now I see that Chris Bakrish is with us, right? He's connected. I, I am here, yes, hello. Very well, then the floor goes to um, Chris. Uh, we are okay. eager to learn from you about the developments in the EU legislation. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. I'm just going to share my slides and hopefully you'll be able to see them there. Okay, thank you. Um, so yes, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be able to speak to you today. Um, and uh, I'm sorry not to be there in person. Um, and thank you for Pavel stepping in um, in my place in the first, first instance. I was in the wrong Zoom room, I think. Um, but it's it's, I think also good to sort of follow up his presentation with this, which will be quite a different presentation. Um, I think where his presentation was obviously very detailed and going into the domestic law, this is a little bit more high level um, and going into developments that we've seen in the EU as in the last few years. Um, my name's Chris Buckridge. I've probably met many of you in my time working for the RIPE NCC. Um, I'm not working for RIPE NCC anymore. I'm a member of the UN Internet Governance Forum Multi-Stakeholder Advisory Group. Um, and next month I will be joining the ICANN board. But this presentation is my own 
personal views, so please take them um, in that regard. The main thing I think that's important to note uh, and see in EU legislative and regulatory developments is how many of them there are. Um, and that's kind of where the Little Earthquakes title of this presentation comes from. It's acknowledging that this is not a sort of single major um, piece of legislation or regulatory effort that is changing the ground for operators, but it's many small, well, small and large regulatory initiatives that are changing the industry, changing how operators need to work with governments, with law enforcement, with their customers. Um, and this diagram um, was produced by Bruegel, which is an, a European economic think tank. Um, and it's a, there's a, a link there. If you use the um, QR code, you can follow that. It, it shows basically a huge range of different legislative initiatives in the last years that relate to internet and internet operations. And the number is, is huge. They're obviously a huge number. One thing I want to also point out now, if you, oh, hang on, sorry, take away, sorry, I'm just going back here. Yeah, if we take away the um, the ones in white, those are the ones that were from before 2020. I think this is an interesting um, insight here into how much has happened just in the last three years, how heavily the, the activity has moved on in terms of internet regulation. Um, and it also shows the areas where there was already regulation and work being done. You see here in e-commerce and consumer protection, there was a lot, a lot of historical um, regulation in terms of trust and safety, in terms of media, certainly. Um, but then there are other areas where it's really all happened just in the last three years in terms of finance, in terms of industrial policy, um, and in terms of cybersecurity. Now, this presentation is by necessity going to be um, a mile wide and about an inch deep. So that is, I'm, I'm going to try and cover in the 15 minutes that I have uh, a number of different topics, um, hopefully topics that are of some relevance to, to this audience. But it's only a small subset, as you can see here on the screen, of the overall picture. Um, and even within that, uh, not going to be able to go too deeply into detail on each of these. So what I've included in the slides is, well, a lot of links and some QR codes. So if you want to go see the slides later on, you can follow the links, or if you're just watching this, you can use your um, camera, camera phone and follow the links to some of the relevant information. But so what I want to look at today is uh, Telecoms Act Fair Share Initiative, the NIST 2 Directive, the e-evidence regulation, the Cyber Resilience Act, um, the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act, those kind of work together, um, the AI Act, and then another one which is not included in the Bruegel um, framework, which is DNS for EU, which obviously has some relevance to this group. So fair share. This is probably a good place to start. And if you noticed on the previous slide, it was the only one of the, the topics I'm going to talk about, which doesn't have a current um, legislative initiative. So essentially it's just a discussion that has been happening between the commission, the parliament and industry. And it's really actually a very old discussion. Um, it's called, we can call it network fees. It can be called fair share. It can be called sending network party pays. But it comes down to the question of whether government wants to compel content providers. So that can be content distribution networks. It can be Google. It could be um, Netflix to pay money to the companies that provide the network infrastructure to end users. And traditionally, that's the tel telcos, the tel telecommunication organizations. So in Europe, obviously, by virtue of the, the structure and of the, the different strengths of um, the different economies. This now has a bit of a spin of 
do we want to force US big tech companies to pay our EU telcos, which are often now private companies, but still were their former state-owned incumbents. And this has been a really charged atmosphere um, between the commission on one side who have come out very strongly in favour of the telcos, pushing that that um, position, which has also been enunciated by ETNO, which is the industry association for the European telcos. And then on the other side, many in the internet industry who see this as really a, not the way to go. Um, and it, it is a discussion that has been had previously. It was had in the ITU in an international context around 2012. And the decision there was not to do to do this. Um, but then in some other countries, there have been laws that have um, established this kind of relationship. So South Korea is the one most commonly cited. But there are many implications for what this would mean um, if it was done, particularly in terms of internet, uh, in terms of network neutrality, um, because it would establish a new customer client relationship between these big tech companies and these large telcos. So that would leave many of the SMEs, the small and medium operators, out in a very um, different different context. Now, this is, as I say, not yet a legislative initiative, but in June, the parliament passed a resolution that did call for measures to ensure fair contribution from large traffic generators. Um, so it's likely this is going to come on the table in the next year or so, um, though it's going to compete a little with um, European elections and the change of commission, um, which will happen in that period as well. So onto something a little bit more solid, and that's NIST 2. Um, and that's shorthand for the update to the 2016 Network and Information Systems Directive, um, which is essentially applying to the security of those networks and ensuring um, that essential services are protected or are sufficiently regulated. Now that directive, the NIST 2 update, has been in effect from January of this year. Um, because it's a directive in the EU parlance, that means that each member state has to incorporate it into their national law um, in the way that they see fit. A regulation is applies as, as plain text for all member states. A directive can be applied differently across different states. There was some early focus in the development of NIST 2 about um, efforts from the Commission to include European root server operators in the law. And so that would have meant that certainly the root server operators who are headquartered in Europe, and that's the RIPE NCC and NetNode, um, would have been drawn into the law, would have been required to, um, act, to be regarded as operators of essential services. It may also have meant that any other root server operator providing a node in Europe would have been drawn into scope. That was not really clear. Um, but there was a lot of coordinated community engagement with the different institutions, and particularly with the parliament, which ensured that in the final negotiation, that text wasn't included uh, in this too. But there are certainly requirements on other actors, and that includes the country code top-level domain um, operators, and they're specifically called out in Article 28 um, as needing to ensure accuracy in their registration data. But this is where there has been actually some concern from the CCTLD operator community um, and others that that status as a directive, which means it will be implemented differently in different states, will result in different rules um, that in terms of what the CCTLD CCTLDs need to provide and how they need to provide it. Um, and that may result in uh, different levels of, of compliance, different levels of difficulty for the different operators. Um, so I've included a link there to a statement by ECHO, which is the German uh, Internet Industry Association. Um, and it captures some of those concerns that particularly the CCTLD operators have had. Now, e-evidence. Again, we're talking here about security. Um, we're talking about um, how law enforcement can do their job. And this is a package that actually includes both a regulation and a directive. 
Um, and it's designed to ensure that easier and faster, make it easier and faster for police and judicial authorities to access the evidence that they'll need in investigations. Now, this was actually, I mean, to the last bullet here, this was about five years in negotiation. This was first mooted in 2018 um, as something necessary. And the most significant element of this, and this was something that was particularly of interest to the Ripen CC, an organization based in, in the Netherlands, is that legal orders for electronic evidence will be able to be made from other EU states directly to operators, organizations, without having to go through the local courts in that. So whereas under previous situation, an organization like the RIPE NCC, to get evidence, you would have to go to a Dutch court and get a Dutch court order to release the evidence. Now, a judge or a court in any other EU jurisdiction can simply order the RIPE NCC um, to hand over that evidence. So that, that makes things a little different, difficult and different. Um, and there are some questions about uh, what measures there would be in place to uh, ensure consistency, ensure um, legitimacy in, in terms of doing that. Um, but that has come into force and so now is, is starting to sort of play out. Uh, the regulation actually will come in in August 2026. But then the Cyber Resilience Act, moving a little bit away or changing the focus a little bit in terms of the security focus here is much more about hardware and software products and ensuring that um, requirements are met throughout their whole life cycle. Now, there was a lot of concern and there was some discussion of this, again, in the RIPE community, um, but also in, in other parts of the operator community. And it, one of the specific concerns was from the open source community. Um, and while the European Commission on their website actually does note some specified exclusions, such as open source software, um, there were still a lot of concerns about what this Cyber Resilience Act, which would place requirements on developers of hardware and software, um, whether that might have a chilling effect on the development and production of open source software. And so there was a big public consultation held at the beginning of this year. Um, the current draft has been approved by the parliamentary committee in July, so it still needs to go to the full parliament um, this, this year. Um, but it is, it is moving quite quickly through the, the process. And there's an article linked there from Martin Ertzen um, from NL Net Labs, which is really laying out the concerns that open source developers have about this Cyber Resilience Act. Jumping to the Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act, um, I don't have a huge amount to say on these two other than that they were debated endlessly um, following their proposal in 2020 um, and have now come into force and we're now starting to see how they're being applied. And the most relevant, interesting thing about these, these um, acts is their application to some very big players. Um, so the DSA in April designated 19 platforms and three search engines as very large online platforms. And they have therefore some very um, intense restrictions and requirements placed on them. One of those included there is Wikipedia, which has been of course a source of some concern, but most of the others are large for-profit um, companies. The DMA, Digital Markets Act, um, talks more about gatekeepers and has identified six. And so that's, um, I can't see my slide here, but it's Alphabet, um, Amazon, Bit, BitDance, ByteDance, um, and Microsoft, and some others. Um, and get, those gatekeepers have to abide a series of do's and don'ts, particularly in how they manage their relationship with customers. So what they can require their customers, what they can prevent their customers from doing. Um, so this is this is... An interesting um, chance to see whether this attempt to regulate some very big international global um, players will work out for the European Union. And then finally, um, one here that I have is the AI Act. Now, this is not necessarily so relevant um, to this community, although it has been a really hot topic in the last 18 months. 
um, and particularly with with ChatGPT and DALI coming on the on the public scene. And the EU effort is really just one of very many, including work in the Council of Europe on a convention. Um, the Security Council in the United Nations has been having discussions about AI, and there have been a huge number of national regulations um, in the offing, including a lot coming out of China, which is certainly significant. Um, the EU themselves described the AI Act as the, f- the world's first comprehensive AI law. Not sure how seriously to take that, but it is certainly a very significant um, attempt to regulate the AI space. Um, and Parliament adopted a position in June but notably with some very significant changes to the original draft, um, including some greater protections for for users um, and and constraints on developers. And that's, again, going back to the NIST 2, an example of how the different institutions in the EU, the Commission, the Parliament and the Council, um, have some different views and different priorities at times uh, so that the legislation can change as it moves through and then finally, DNS for EU. Um, this was announced sort of in 2020 as well, along with DSA, DMA, and also NIST 2. And it's establishing a public DNS resolver um, established in the EU and funded initially, at least, by the EU. Um, there was a tender process last year. Whalebone, a consortium based in Chechia, was, develop- was um, commissioned to develop the service. Um, and this is just some information. There is a presentation um, that was given very recently at DNS OARC 41, um, which talked about the progress being made here and the plans that Whalebone has. But I thought it was interesting to see this, this comment that the EU desires to make this the officially recommended DNS resolver for public and governmental institutions. Um, now, I think it's also intended to be for the public at large, um, but there is this very clear focus on public institutions and government. One last thing, which I won't go into too, into too much depth on, but there has been a lot of discussion over the last years about sanctions and the impact that they have on the internet, particularly in relation to the core global functions, the DNS, the IP address registrations. Um, there was a study that uh, Fazane Badi carried out, funded by the RIPE NCC. It's definitely worth having a look at um, and, and in what she has to say there. So that brings me to the end. I put here some useful resources, certainly, that I've drawn on and that can give a lot more information on, on these RIPE Labs, the RIPE NCC's website, um, Centre, the um, uh, regional CCTLD group has a lot of policy documents and inputs on these discussions, and ECHO, the German Internet Industry Association. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Chris. Well, I would like to notice that the development of EU um, regulation legislation is the process that uh, uh, covers many different aspects. Um, but uh, my question is, when the European Commission designated the gatekeepers. Not all companies agreed with uh, with that designation. Is there any process to appeal or to contest uh, the designation? Because uh, I, I remember reading somewhere that some companies want to call uh, to be removed from the list. It's- so I'm I'm not actually sure if there is a, an official process. I'm sure there is discussions, but I think the fact that the for the Digital Markets Act they only landed on six of these these gatekeepers. So Alphabet, Amazon, Apple, ByteDance, Meta, and Microsoft. They really have gone with the very big actors there. I think they sort of it, it in some ways been a quite um, uh, cautious approach by the EU in that regard in only sort of setting, at least initially, these very large global companies who really would have a lot of trouble um, arguing that they're not in that that sort of top tier of groups. But it's also interesting to see the, the different 
as I say, 22 different um, platform services which are provided by or by these six, um, and the ones that actually fall out of of being regarded under the Digital Markets Act. So, for instance, Gmail by Alphabet is not included, um, even though YouTube and others others are. Um, and so, that, that I think this will evolve over time. As I say, I think it's um, a, a bit of an experiment to see how effective this will be, how how much the the European Commission can throw its weight um, around in trying to regulate these very big global actors. Well, thanks uh, for this um, uh, input. Um, again, it's important that you still retain some flexibility and um, adjust your policy um, accordingly. Again, Chris, uh, thank you so much for your overview. It was extremely useful. And we will continue. Um, since this is a section on IT legislation, we decided that we uh, wanted uh, uh, to look into court practice. I probably heard that in the United States recently there was a case where an emoji was uh, um, uh, was. Um, recognized uh, as um, a valid uh, form of expressing consent and many of the local lawyers were very surprised and uh, shocked sometimes but also I remember raising a case uh, about this uh, yesterday or the day before that that a similar decision was taken by local courts in rostov on Don in Russia and uh, we were all shocked to see this um, copying of American practices, but actually there was another case before that last year, another Russian uh, court uh, confirmed that an emoji can be treated as an expression of consent under a contract. Uh, so uh, again, um, Russia is, uh, the region is definitely not uh, uh, lagging behind the international uh, trends, but uh, again, uh, to uh, find out more about the current court practice. Let's give floor to Yekaterina Kalinichiva. She's a partner with Semyonov and Pierzner Law Firm, and she has been a long standing partner of Tilde Khan and Vic and uh, all kinds of uh, um, forums that we organize in the region. Well, uh, the microphone is working. You can hear me. Good to uh, see you and when you here. Is it my fourth, fifth still decon? I don't remember. But any of you know me as a representative of the rights owners. It is still true. Uh, well, I used to be uh, on the side of proprietors. Uh, rights holders, copyright holders, and I spoke on their behalf here, but then I uh, started experiencing some evolution. I realized that it's okay to copyright with registrars, and now I still uh, represent uh, rights holders and owners, but uh, in uh, uh, my practice, I get more and more cases when I represent a third party in a dispute, um, a website or a registrar. Well, I expect that the time will come pretty soon uh, when I will be defending registrars and courts uh, but today, uh, let's see uh, what people um, argue about uh, in the in the um, e internet in terms of internet assets. Uh, what the internet is arguing about? Uh, this is not my personal practice. Uh, I think that uh, what I mean to say is. Um, these, these will not be my cases. I did not participate in them. Uh, however, I am, I'm very, I'm very familiar with all these cases. Let's start with the uh, first um, takeaway: domain registration cannot be returned through the court after its cancellation. The, that's the judgment of the Intellectual Property Rights Court. Um, 
and that's that's how the story ended but uh, where did it start uh, pin uh, brought action pay to court pin is a saint petersburg registrar and uh, the other party to the dispute was action pay pin is the copyright holder to a pin trademark the priority date is the 3rd of February 2010, and um, there was also a PIN.RU administered uh, by Action Pay. The domain was registered uh, at a later date in 2017. That's why PIN um, wanted to uh, submit the claim to court and to protect its trademark and also its uh, business name in court. In the court, PIN claimed that the trademark was registered for telecom services. This is class 37, uh, and this includes virtual hosting and IP addresses and everything else, and they do provide the services. And the defendant uh, claimed that uh, the PIN.RU, uh, it's an empty website, but um, the defendant uh, uh, provided a business plan to host a social media media at pin.ru. So the question was whether uh, class 37 includes social media. So the claimant managed to prove that they are similar services, telecom services can um, help people establish uh, a connection between themselves and social media exists for that purpose. It brings people, uh, it connects people basically. Um, so it, they are similar services um, and um, the domain name uh, uses a, um, a trademark, which is a violation of the rights uh, owner's rights. Of course, uh, the defendant didn't like the resolution of the court and he appeals the decision. Uh, he still says the domain is empty. Uh, and since it's empty, there was no uh, violation of the copyright or whatever other rights. But the court again uh, says that it's just a plan. And uh, if you have a plan to host the uh, social media there, even the administering the domain name every day is still a violation of the uh, rights of the uh, claimant. At that time, PIN used the um, uh, right to transfer the domain, a priority right to transfer the domain name to uh, themselves. Uh, they also had PIN.SU, uh, uh, PIN.RF, so with a priority right, they uh, uh, transferred uh, PIN.RU uh, to their current domain name. And then after a month, the defendant again um, appeals uh, the uh the decision of the previous instance and that time at that time action pay says that okay you use the priority right but uh, give us the domain back because the uh, court uh, uh canceled the decision they went to uh our CS, the registrar who refused to do that and then the intellectual property rights court not only um uh, cancelled the decisions of the early instances, but uh, it referred the uh, case to a new resolution. And the court, in the first instance again, uh, said that uh, they do uh, prohibit using PIN.RU not in general, but only for class 37. Action Pay decided to become a claimant and PIN. And RSIC uh, become the defendants. RCIS is a registrant, is a registrar. So the um, claimant wants to uh, become the registrant for um, PIN.RU again. Uh, Pavel talked about the nature of the domain name, and the court explained that domain name cannot belong to the administrator or the registrant on the right of ownership. There are relations between the uh, registrar and the registrar on the basis of a services contract. And the very fact that PIN's rights were violated, well, not all of them, but uh, with respect to class 37, the claimant was preparing to use uh, PIN.RU uh, for a class 37 services. Uh, there are still reasons to use the priority right 
to transfer the domain name to the defendant this time. Besides, after the domain name is cancelled, all the uh, history is uh, cleared, all the records are removed, so technically it would still be impossible to return the um, domain uh, name uh, to uh, to, uh, to uh, that the original owner. Uh, then it turned out that RCS is no longer the registrar of the PIN.RU, it was um, PIN itself. And I'll tell you uh, about one more court case. No uh, domain name rights were violated, but still, uh, Raventa, probably uh, the ladies here are familiar with the products of this company. Uh, they uh, own uh, several uh, trademarks, and there is a website, uh, techport.ru, that uh, publicized the pro products of Raventa. Raventa didn't like that uh, as the rights owner and they uh, wanted the court to uphold their rights. Since I start uh, with the conclusions, well, the uh, registrant, the domain registrant uh, was found liable, although the registrant transferred the right to administer the domain name to a third party. So um, here goes, the registrant um, contracted seller well, the seller is the name of the company. Um, back in 2018, the defendant uh, wanted to engage this company uh, called a seller uh, as a third party in this uh, trial. The court didn't allow that. These are the terms of the agreement of this of this contract. Um, Seller uh, acted as the domain registrant. The agreement said that the website could not publish information uh, contrary to the Russian legislation, and the registrant has the right to, contr uh, to control the use of the domain name. Still, the court said that no evidence was provided that the registrant was not using this domain name, that a different person was uh, using the domain name, and the court disagreed that the registrant is an information intermediary. The court says that this is contrary to the Russian legislation and the registrant, having uh, transferred the right to administer the domain to a third party, is a perpetrator, and uh, the registrant was fined 30,000 rubles, and the Court of Appeal upheld the decision of the Court of the Early Instance. And the third case I wanted to discuss, and it's not here, it's not in the presentation, you know why I decided to find a case where a domain a registrant uh, registrant uh, would win the case, and uh, I found one, but Anton, uh, I, fo I found out that Anton um, uh, was the representative of the defendant in this case, and I thought that I better not include it, since it's not my case, it's Anton's, and Anton is here, and he'll talk about it. Uh, if time permits. Yes, uh, speaking about time, we decided that we will ask no questions to the speakers. Again, uh, if you would like to learn more, then please find Ekaterina offline. She's um, a very responsive person. Uh, you can put your questions to her directly. And to save time, let's uh, move now to our next speaker, uh, the CEO of Internet and Prava, Internet and Law Company, Anton Sergo. If um, you don't know it, but Anton uh, published several books on domain names. He's an author, uh, the court on intellectual property celebrating its 10th anniversary. And in the um, Journal of Intellectual Property, he published uh, uh, an article, a paper on out of court settlement. Um, so again, uh, no questions to Anton. Uh, not at this point, uh, at least, uh, but uh, I suggest that you find uh, Anton uh, during the coffee break. Okay, well, thank you for your introduction. Uh, 
объекта и, собственно, целесообразно. Speaking about, uh, well, answering the question that you didn't ask me, you put this question to Pavel, whether it's uh, it makes sense to regulate domain names uh, at the level of legislation. Well, I believe that, yes, legislation is necessary because uh, the more certainty, the better for any business. And uh, domain names uh, are still uncertain. Uh, it's uh, an uncertain entity in terms of uh, uh, what object of uh, of law it is uh, there is still a lot of uncertainty in uh, court disputes i mean every uh, i mean uh, uh, there are many trials around domain names and uh, they often uh, end up in a rather in unpredictable uh, manner again that's why that's why i think that uh, uh, legislation wouldn't be amiss. Yes, we can hope for uh, self-regulation, uh, but it's been 20 years uh, now since 1998. We talk, uh, we've been talking about self-regulation. Self-regulation and um, uh, hasn't been very efficient. Uh, so uh, I, I, I suggest that it's one area where we indeed need more government um, regulation. Another problem is that often the administrative regulation is uh, far from actual practice and the needs of the industry. So uh, it means that what's missing here is the dialogue between the community and the government agencies uh, to develop uh, to develop a regulation that would be suitable for all parties. Um, as to UDRP, UDRP is well known um, in the expert community. Uh, I uh, uh, remember uh, three, three um, occasions when uh, uh, there was a lot of attention to this policy uh, in Russia in the early 2000s, there was a huge discussion of joining the system. Uh, it was decided not to uh, go on this path. There was uh, there were concerns that uh, sovereignty may be lost if disputes are settled outside of the Russian frontiers, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing. Well, actually, again, the practice shows that in Russia there is still no um, a single uh, set of, there is no single set of rules. Uh, to uh, settle these conflicts, which is again bad for the business, which loves uh, certainty and predictability. Although our um, uh, national domain area, that are you, is uh, the seventh largest in the world, again, the resolution of the domain disputes um, are uh, is an uncertain process. Um, so uh, when uh, new GTLDs and IDNs were launched, caused uh, uh, a new interest to UDRP and about 18, to, uh, 18 months or 24 months ago, I saw another wave of uh, uh, interest to UDRP um, on the part of the uh, relevant and competent government agencies. It would be great if the industry could join this discussion and the um, regulation that could be imposed by the government could be quite negative for the development of the industry if the government does it on its own, at its own discretion. As to UDRP itself, the policy is wonderful. It was developed by ICANN, and ICANN is a competent uh, agency. There are six centers around the world. Uh, but again, the question is, who are the judges? Uh, and I mean, literally, in the last 18 months, I see certain discrimination of uh, Russian parties to the disputes uh, based on uh, the uh, set of judges that uh, take up uh, cases with uh, involvement of Russian parties. If, again, um, I see that uh, there are fewer cases taken to uh, UDRP, uh, 
from the uh, Russian uh, uh, entities. Uh, they are waiting for better times. Uh, it feels like uh, we also see uh, a, a trend of migrating uh, domain resources from international jurisdictions into Russian jurisdiction uh, uh, for fear of uh, discrimination. Uh, during the first uh, session today, we heard that uh, uh, this industry is uh, purely um, te technical. It's not. It's not political. However, uh, the legal experts supporting the industry feel that uh, politics plays a great role in how the disputes are settled. As to the applicability to Russian domain areas, it applies. UDRP applies to that. Uh, Rus Moscow Moscow that worked online uh, site com DT uh, Catholic. Catholic, uh, they are the uh, areas where we have a lot of reg or domain zones where we have a lot of registrations. The resolutions are often taken abroad. The decisions that can be passed by a Russian court on these domain zones in most cases will be uh, either unenforceable or since to enforce uh, a Russian court a decision of a Russian court, uh, well, it will be very difficult for a foreign uh, registrar to enforce or to act on the decision of the Russian uh, court. Uh, the uh, Russian courts, however, refer quite often to UDRP, the quote from UDRP, and they again refer uh, to these provisions, uh, but at the same uh, time, uh, they uh, retain uh, their well, immunity, if you will. The whole system is um, uh, quite intricate. Uh, it's uh, unique and uh, you can't find um, analogs to it in other branches of law. I uh, talked to other experts uh, and they confirmed that uh, no, they, they can't think of any other system that wouldn't have some, uh, I don't know, government system to consolidate the arbitrages, uh, no single system of always the center of arbitration. There is no enforcement of uh, decisions, but in 20 years, uh, we don't know of a single case when the decision would not be uh, enforced, would not be uh, acted upon uh, or uh, complied with. It's an absolutely unique uh, system, but uh, uh, it's very pretty unfamiliar to the uh, uh, Russian legal experts. Uh, applicability of the UDRP, again, it applies to uh, all the new GTLDs. Uh, uh, Russia um, um, is interested in this system. And um, uh, there is some uh, uh, discrimination of uh, the um, uh, Russian parties uh, in these disputes. There are uh, languages of only few of the centers of arbitration uh, have Russian speaking arbiters and Russian for them is not the main uh, language. They are not very fluent in it quite often. So again, uh, language is one of the barriers to using UDRP. And you can't assemble a panel of, uh, of arbiters uh, out of the, say, three Russian-speaking um, judges. Again, um, we are very pressed for time, so I'm going to skip several slides here describing the system. Uh, like I was saying, about a year and a half, maybe two years ago, uh, the Russian government uh, started paying more attention to this uh, system. Uh, its interest was um, uh, heightened. Uh, Ross Patent, for instance, the regulator of intellectual property in Russia is definitely interested in learning more and perhaps adopting UDRP. And since um, there are discussions around this, uh, probably the industry should be involved so that um, e e this, this matter will, would be uh, settled without the participation of the uh, community. Uh, again, 
uh, so Ross uh, Patent, the uh, uh, Russian uh, patenting uh, uh, agency, is uh, one uh, venue where such a procedure could be established. Another possibility is that it will be Roskomnadzor, the Russian uh, telecom supervisor, which is probably uh, a much worse uh, scenario. So once again, the community needs to be involved if it wants a decision that uh, uh, doesn't contradict its own interests. So I indeed published several books on domain names and domain disputes and Russian UDRP, UDRP in Russia. This is a scenario, this is my vision of a scenario of how UDRP could be implemented in uh, Russia. UDRP is just one um, uh, procedure out of 69 available in the world to settle uh, domain name related disputes. They are all interesting, they are all exciting and uh, uh, special and we can learn from all this ex experience and all these uh, 70 systems are described in my other uh, book. UDRP or um, domain uh, domain name related disputes. Okay, thank you, Anton. Uh, UDRP is often known as an administrative procedure, but when uh, experts in foreign law hear the word administrative, they say, well, it's not private law. Uh, so for the lawyers, when they hear administrative, it means not criminal, administrative, uh, administrative law. It's no, well, actually, it's a, a procedure of arbitration. It's a private um, procedure of arbitration, not administrative. It's uh, not your regular. Um, Uh, not your regular um, arbitration clause, it's a special procedure. Uh, now, we'd like to turn to our next uh, speaker, Vladislav Javnerchik. Uh, He is the leading uh, legal counsel at uh, Hoster BY. He is a well-known uh, legal expert. Uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much for the introduction. I was very happy to um, listen to the earlier presentations. I'm the last to speak in this session. Uh, I consider myself lucky because uh, uh, I will be able to adjust my presentation to what has already been said. And I know that I stand between you and lunch, so I'll try to be brief. In my talk today, I will uh, cover three main topics. The first one is the legal nature of domains. Uh, I will stay on the practical plane. Uh, there is an interesting uh, institution of domain inheritance. Uh, we are one of the uh, well. Uh, we, uh, we are one of um, the biggest stakeholders in Belarus in this area. So we initiate certain changes to the uh, regulation covering the uh, uh, in in inheritance of domains and fighting cyber uh, crime, cyber squatting. If we talk, that's uh, uh, another uh, curious uh, set of. Um, issues that uh, require a better regulation. In Belarus, there is an analytical center uh, attached to the president and uh, Hoster BY for more than 10 years was the technical administrator of the domain Now it's the uh, analytical center of the president and uh, it means that we are in close contact with them and we can communicate all the pains and concerns that private businesses have so that this analytical center not only um, uh, 
uh, not only uh, practices the current legislation, but it has the uh, mandate to initiate uh, the amendments to the legislation anyway. So uh, to the legal nature of domain uh, names, what is a domain name? Uh, there are discussions of the lawyers, of the uh, jurists as to how to classify domain names and where attempt uh, to claim that domain is a means of individualization. Uh, there is a case I will be sharing with you a bit later, but um, actually there is a domain uh, definition that uh, considers a domain to be a symbolic designation in practical terms. Uh, we also talk about the right to administer domain name. Uh, in Belarus, we are still discussing whether domain can be uh, treated as a means of uh, individualization because the civil code uh, uh, offers an open list of means of individualization and uh, there were attempts and still attempts to uh, uh, substantiate that a domain name uh, can be classified as a means of individualization, just like a trade name or a trademark. Uh, again, uh, I will uh, share with you um, a case, uh, and the Supreme Court uh, has a college on uh, intellectual rights property that uh, makes judgments in this area. So. Uh, uh, we can always refer to the judgments and resolutions. They are the final instance in the country, uh, apart from the supervisory capacity of the prosecutor's office. So uh, uh, their rulings are final and uh, mandatory for everyone. The uh, procedure is quite uh, transparent. And it's clear to understand which way the practice is um, making progress. Um, uh, this is a domain, uh, a general international uh, definition. So probably nothing new for you. Another uh, piece of theory, uh, how do we classify the domain name administration? Uh, moving on, uh, civil rights. How do we correlate the domain with the objects of civil uh, rights? Well, uh, we need to start with the right of administer the domain name, uh, that means the right of use, it's a personal right, and this um, dispute I wanted to um, bring bring up, uh, it uh, is quite an old one from 2008. In uh, Belarus in particular, legislation was emerging at that time, and it was a very famous case. Uh, the uh, claimant believed that, uh, the, or rather the defendant believed that uh, uh, the domain name is a means of individualization. It's not a trademark. Uh, but the court uh, disagreed with the defendant's position. It, uh, it uh, concluded that the domain is not a means of individualization, but it can include designations already used in trademarks. So it was a curious case. Uh, today the domain is, it, it, it doesn't have its own means of protection. It can be used as part of means of individualization, but it uh, doesn't stand as a, uh, an independent means of uh, uh, individualization. So I believe that even if 
we go back to a discussion around that, it will not lead to anything much. Because again, there is a uh, there seems to be a consensus on this matter. Uh, so the rights to a domain name, or rather the rights to administer a domain name, uh, is classified as a property right. As to which contracts. Uh, can be used to exercise our rights to administer domain name. In Belarus, uh, there is a regulation which prescribes the type of uh, the contract. In that situation, that would be the contract of the transfer of rights or the contract of session. As to whether the domain name can be leased, no, it can't. Only uh, rights can be transferred. Есть определенные критерии, связанные с тем, что это сам договор по спине поименован у нас в гражданском кодексе, и, соответственно, к нему должны применять к нему условия, какие условия считать существенными. Это вопрос тоже, который лежит в практической плоскости, потому что есть примеры, когда мы сталкиваемся с договорами как регистратор передачи. There are some contracts that we as a registrar have to handle. One of the issues that we have to face is whether these contracts must be, in all cases, uh, fee-based. The civil code says that the contracts, um, the, the parties may agree uh, that uh, they enter into uh, that uh, that that the rights are transferred on a, a gratuitous basis, uh, compensation free, uh, but uh, uh, again, it's uh, one unsettled uh, um, issue uh, whether all these contracts must always be fee based. Now, how can we uh, make use of domain names? We can uh, pass it on to our hires according to Belarus legislation. In practice, this creates a lot of uh, problems. Но и интереснее скорее то, как это реализуется на практике, потому что, ну, собственно, мы говорим да, о нормах инструкции, ранее мы упомянули, какая процессуальная возможность предусмотрена, но я сразу перейду к проблематике, с которой мы сегодня столкнулись. Есть... So on the one hand, um, и, uh, on the one hand, the legislation allows for it. On the other hand, the notary is uh, uh, public uh, say that, well, you know that they, that they can um, that they can register a uh, uh, last will and uh, testament, testament distributing the uh, estate between several heirs, uh, successors. So how can you uh, distribute a domain name between several persons if it's part of the estate. You have several successors and the law is silent on this matter. So we talk to, we, we ask the Ministry of Justice. Uh, people come to us uh, and they bring uh, certificates of inheritance uh, determining that, say, the share of this particular person in the total estate is one uh, fourth, it's a quarter. So the Ministry of Justice said there is the Constitution, uh, there are laws and bylaws that uh, prioritize uh, protection of the rights of heirs. So 
how are we supposed to interpret this answer? Yes, we understand there is a constitution, there is the law, and we must protect uh, the rights of the heirs. Uh, but basically, the Ministry of Justice says that we wash our hands at this point. We don't know what to do, and um, the legislation, uh, since it's silent on it, we are not going to uh, give you any interpretation. So we still exist in this uh, legal vacuum. Uh, we uh, are trying to come up with continuous ways of transferring the rights. So on the one hand, the Ministry of Justice says that we must protect the rights of the heirs. On the other hand, those heirs come to us and they say, here is our share. Can we have a share in the domain name? One letter, maybe, two letters. So we believe that one solution, one possible solution is того, что если домен, предлагаем внести изменения уже сегодня инструкцию, ну либо же пойти таким путем сам. Is well, first of all, we definitely will have to change this instruction, and uh, the two options that we have is to exclude domains from the estate. Но сегодня практика такая достаточно интересная, и нам, в принципе, как же дневцы не приходится сталкиваться. Uh, or to offer to the successors to manage the domain jointly. Anyway. Uh, as to cyber crimes, this is the last uh, section of my presentation. Um, type of scort scorting, phishing, phishing. Uh, there are many different cri crimes uh, taking place these days. Uh, we saw a surge in the number of um, uh, uh, domains uh, registered in Belarus that uh, uh, turn out to be uh, similar to the well-known Russian brands. Uh, Fish and Landscape uh, did a study. They found some very impressive number of those uh, cases. Uh, BY and Bell uh, are also under the risk of cyber squatting. We learn from the experience of uh, the cctld.ru. How uh, what they do is they uh, undelegate uh, the domain name in case of uh, an abuse. The sooner we act, the more uh, grandmother's pensions we save. And people do tend to lose their savings, their apartments, when they hit the wrong link. The courts can decide to undelegate the registrar, uh, can undelegate, and also uh, the court bailiffs can I undelegate, but not law enforcement authorities in the course of their investigation. So uh, one of the initiatives that we proposed is to enable law enforcement authorities on the basis of a well-founded request uh, from the head of the law enforcement agencies to suspend, suspend a domain administration or to undelegate the domain name. The technical um, administrator uh, cannot uh, help in those cases. In any case, uh, uh, often the process takes too long for the process to happen faster. Uh, we would like law enforcement authorities to get that authority and in conclusion of this presentation, I wanted to invite you once again to the Minsk IGF. And I see the organizers are already showing me signs that I need to finish the presentation. Chris mentioned that uh, the European legislation is developing in um, the field of artificial intelligence, uh, while the National Academy of Sciences of the Republic of Belarus uh, proposed a draft law on AI, and uh, maybe uh, we, can't, we we have uh, time to discuss that during the intellectual property uh, rights uh, session.
Thank you very much, Vladislav. Действительно, там рука на пульсе держит и дорабатывает документы, когда возникает вопрос, чтобы их решить, чтобы не было как раз минимально свести к минимуму судебные споры. Uh, in the coordination center, uh, rules and uh, procedures, many of the topics that you uh, discussed already covered, this is true, as to inheritance. Uh, Sergei Kopolov present here um, has long been a uh, uh, proponent of the idea that the domain name should not be included into a state under any circumstances. In fact, uh, we see that our two countries, uh, we uh, often face uh, the same uh, challenges. A domain name is a domain name everywhere. Uh, thanks for being with us. Uh, we understand that the presentations, um, uh, the, 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 the speakers had to uh, speak very fast. Uh, the law is our actual service. We are trying to help. Even if you think that we are interfering, actually we are trying to help. Uh, again, thank you for being with us, for listening uh, to us. We are always happy to come to this event. Thank you very much and see you next time.